I want to welcome and thank Dr. Michael Kunish and Erwin Curl will introduce him to you. So I want to thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so in a formal sense, I'm uh, one of the trustees for the Michael Kudish Natural History Preserve in Stanford. Um, but in a less formal sense, I've been uh, privileged to be friends with Dr. Kudish for a few decades now. And I've uh, been on many hikes, and whether it's uh, taking a hike into a bog or mapping first growth forest or doing a program at the preserve, I always, um, it's just a wealth of knowledge. I should be paying him tuition just to follow him. <laughs> and <clears throat> if you've never been on a hike with him, you should join him. Um, he's still bushwhack and we'll be going up a incline like this and I'm just trying to catch my breath and keep up. And Mike is leading the way and lecturing the whole time. So he's, well, a week ago uh, too, say I was trying music. to get up the incline, it's so steep I slid back down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. So yeah, if you uh, do have a chance, do hike with Mike, you'll learn a lot, but be prepared for, it could be an arduous hike, um, and if you're taking a sample out of the bog, it might be a deep sample, it's a lot of work, so, but uh, today he's going to talk about uh, something that's integral to the history of this town and the entire region, the hemlocks, uh, there are some threats to their population, so Mike's going to talk about uh, six specific topics about the uh, past and future of our beloved uh, yeah. 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 hemlocks. And do you want to? No, not yet. Okay. All right. This, this thing makes me nervous. If I turn this bulb on to test it before the presentation to make sure it's, the machine is focused, it'll be the last time that bulb is going to light. And it'll take two or three hours to replace the bulb. If I wait until it's time to present, and I then I have to focus it, you have to wait only two or three minutes, right in two or three hours. Well, look, do I need my hat? This is outdoor research. It's a gift from the preserve. I don't think I need it now once I've... And the coat is to keep me warm, but I want to show you my shirt which is not an ornament, it's not just a piece of clothing. This is a mountaintop arboretum t-shirt, which has a map of the arboretum on it. It's an integral part of the presentation, because I'm going to use it instead of a transparency. <laughs> wait, wait a minute, what, what is this thing? There's something under here. Oh, 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 it's Brett's microphone. I couldn't figure out what it was. I thought it was something going to bite me. Okay. So, um, Wait a minute, there's something going on in the next room there. Well, can we shut that door? What was that? Oh, well, the, the presentation today is on hemlock, which is appropriate for a tannery museum. And I thought I would present material on the Eastern hemlock that has seldom or never been presented before. Ideas that we've learned about hemlock only in the last 10, 15 years, so couldn't be presented well before. Um, I call it the ecology and his history and ecology of, of hemlock. So I have my outline and I have about five transparencies to show you and, and the shirt. And I have six topics and I'll show you my structure. What structure? Lecture structure. Uh, the outline to show you uh, where I'm going to start and where I'm going to go. It's more or less chronological, and I touch on a whole bunch of different topics dealing to do with hemlock in one way or another. The first topic uh, starts with bogs and post-glacial forests, bogs with lost hemlocks, and when hemlock came into the Catskills and, and so forth. The second is the, the, cycl the cyclical nature of hemlocks, that the populations come and go. And then the third would be on the tanning and how we see the hemlock stands today depends a lot on what the bark peelers found the stands like 200 years ago, 175 years ago. There's a relationship there. And then I'll speak following the tanning industry. I want to talk to you a little bit about Clark's tannery. Where was Clark's tannery? 
in Clark's factory. Where was Clark's factory? Well, we now know it as Dunraven. You know where Dunraven is? It's a suburb of Margaretville. And then I want to talk about hemlock being weird. Uh, that is, it has a reproduction problem. And that came from an article. I have to show you what I've got there. And then finally, uh, this, this hemlock reproduction problem um, would lead into the last topic, which is on the wood wide web. Not worldwide, but woodwide. Carolyn asked me to talk a little bit about it and offer my thoughts on it. And then I thought I'd introduce Erwin and let him finish up because he knows far more about it than I do. Um, anyway, this topic of hemlock has been published a little bit before. I've got an article here in Catskill Tri-County Historical Views, which ran for five years, 10 issues, and sadly uh, stopped about a year ago. And one of the articles I did was hemlock survival, a timeline. And, and from the time that the bark peelers peeled the hemlock until the, the, the modern day and even prediction of the futures, what the condition that the forest was like 200 years ago when the bark peelers came in has a direct effect on what we see today and, and what will happen in the future. Hey, there's the Zadig Pratt Museum right there. I see it right there advertised. And then I did three articles for CFA News in the past. Catskill Forest Association. There was a Bugs with Lost Hemlocks. There was an article on Clark's Tannery. And there was an article on, which one was this? Oh, Hemlock Weird and Cyclical. So I've done a little bit of writing on it, but never really pulled it all together like this before. So um, first, when did Hemlock first come into the Catskills? Radiocarbon dates, peat samples, Hemlock fossils. Hemlock was here. 13,700 years ago, uh, and, and I'm sure earlier than that, I'm having a little trouble trying to push it back to 14,000, but about 13,007, it's here. I have, how many bogs now that radiocarbon date over 13,000? The number just went up this summer. I think it's over 20 out of 125 bogs and fens. Radiocarbon date to at, at least 13,000 years. And, the 14,000 club, I have eight bogs now that are over 14, and over 20 of them that are over 13. And Hemlock was here 13,700, 13,500, 13,300 years ago. And not just in the southern part of the Catskills, where you think it might have been migrating in post-glacially, all over. Uh, it was the southern to the northern, from the eastern to the western. It's here. It's in abundance. It's everywhere. And so is yellow birch. And balsam fir and red spruce, where they are today, were here 137. So it's no newcomer to the Catskills. Hemlock's been here for a long time. Now, what I thought now, now this is this is gonna get oh I'm, I've been nervous and shaking about this for months. If this machine doesn't light up, what do I do? Oh, oh, oh. Okay, now we can focus, turn upside down, right side up. We have to focus it. Well, who's sitting here? I don't see him. Uh, well, let's see. Wait a minute. There's a, there's a, wait a second. I think there's a knob that you can turn. Yeah. You try that. See what that does. It's not focusing still? Well, oh, you see, I, I'm, my vision isn't that good. So if it's, near, if, it's, if it's focused for you, it may not be focused for me. But that's fine. I'd rather have it that way than the other way around. But I, the thing is, I don't know if I can read it. <laughs> I may have to go back further to read it. Anyway, this is called Bogs with Lost Hemlocks. Where's my title? Here it is. And where's John? This is Kale Bar. I know you'd, you'd be annoyed if I didn't have one. I think I have them on all my maps. North Arrow, too, right? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, OK. <laughs> um, and of course, the, the uh, the, the ratio, the scale ratio changes with how it's enlarged or reduced on the screen. Anyway, um, there are a half a dozen bogs which have lost their hemlock, and I thought I'd talk about that for a few minutes. I'm assuming I have about 50, 55, 60 minutes for the presentation. That's a standard college lecture. So by 1 o'clock, I should be either done or almost so. So I have to move along because there's a lot of material. 
Um, there are six bogs. Is that clear for you? I can't judge. Yeah. Uh, OK. There are six bogs which have lost their hemlocks. In other words, they used to have hemlock in the past, but no longer have them. And I can only guess as to why. And I can tell you where they are. Um, there are two of them on Millbrook Ridge. Uh, my bogs are all numbered. Uh, 310 and 319 are on Millbrook Ridge, uh, which is south of the Millbrook and north of the, the older lake area. And I've got to go back up to 310 uh, uh, this fall and, and, and get some more fossils out of there. It's got some weird fossil assemblages. But anyway, hemlock used to be there 7,500 years ago and 5,200 years ago. It was there. But my next radiocarbon date for a younger uh, peat specimen was 1,600 years ago, and it's gone. So it disappeared sometime between 5,000 and 1,600 years ago. Uh, the other bog, which is farther east on Millbrook Ridge, was, oh, this is a real tight schedule. Uh, 6,400 years ago it was here. 6,100 years ago it was gone. Now, there can be some mistakes there with the sampling techniques because sometimes the sample may happen not by pure chance to pull a hemlock cone or bark or wood or needle out of there. Oh, one of these bogs, I remember getting my first hemlock cone, and it was closed, and it was wet, and it was underground in a bog for five, 6,000 years. And I, it was sitting out on my lab bench, and the next day it opened up. It dried out and warmed up, opened up. That's the first time that cone had seen the light of day in 5,000, 6,000 years. Anyway, so these two on Millbrook Ridge. Um, there's one on Mongo Mountain, which is out by uh, Mongo Pond State Campground. And let's see, uh, how long was that here? 4,850 and gone by 4,200. Don't worry, don't, don't take these dates as that accurate, because it could have been there for quite a while after 4,200. It's just that there's none there. There's hemlock lower down than up on these ridges, lower on the lower slopes, it's gone today. Uh, there's another one called Sid's Notch. This is the lowest elevation one. This is only 2,700. The others are running around 31. So it's way up there. And this one is Sid's Notch. is really the northwest spur of Eagle Mountain. It's between Haynes Hollow and the Dry Brook. It's a little saddle between a knob of, which is like a suburb of Eagle Mountain. And Eagle Mountain is over here. And my only one date was about 6,000 6, years ago and it's in Sid's Notch, it's gone. There's no hemlock anywhere near there. So, and the, the most recent, oh, Balsam Lake Mountain. Um, over here, there's still a bit of question on Balsam Lake Mountain. I'm not 100% sure, oh, I'm blinded by the blub. Um, I'm still not sure about Balsam Lake Mountain. There can be an identification problem. Uh, wood of hemlock versus wood of fir even if you have 100 power under the microscope, can be a little bit tricky sometimes. And there's always that chance that I've misidentified the hemlock wood and it's really nothing but balsam fir. But that wouldn't surprise you, because if you've been up Balsam Lake Mountain, you know the summit is dominated by balsam fir. So uh, it's still a little bit of question on that. But if, if there were hemlock on top of Balsam Lake Mountain, it's uh, 9,500 years ago, 8,700 years ago, and it's gone by 6,200 years ago. So this is, we're talking about thousands of years ago. And this summer, just this summer, I resampled bog number 307, which is at the north end of Drybrook Ridge. If I know we have people here from the 3500 Club, so you know your mountains. Um, if you come in where the north leg of the new Huckleberry Brook Trail comes into the Drybrook Ridge Trail, and just go south, only a quarter of a half a mile, you, come, you go, go around bog 307. I've been studying that for, since I was a student. And I went up there this uh, summer for another reason. I wanted it to uh, get a, a sample from another part of the dog, bog to test a different hypothesis, which I won't go into now. Don knows all about it, because we spoke about it in a railroad yard a few weeks ago. What was that noise? Beep, beep. Oh, is it, is it train time? Oh, OK. <laughs> Um, sorry, I'm a rail buff. I can't help that. Uh, anyway, Drybrook Ridge, uh, there was hemlock. And I found it because instead of sampling out in the open around the bear wall, there's an open little area 
where there's no forest, and that's where I'd been sampling before. Well, this time I sampled in the woods, in the forest, around the open area, and I got wood in the peat sample that I, I was expecting. I knew it was not yellow birch or red maple, and I thought, well, it's some sort of a, um, maybe it's a shrub, like a holly or a wild raisin, but it didn't match those either. The, the, I said, what's the matter with it? There are no vessels, there are no pores. Well, it's got to be a conifer. If it's a conifer, can it be spruce? Impossible. Can it be fir? Possible. But it wasn't fir. It turned out to be hemlock. So we had hemlock on top of Dry Brook Ridge at 3,100 feet 4,200 years ago. It's gone now. Who would ever know that unless you go playing around in the bogs? But what happened at the same elevation, 3,100 feet, about the same time in Millbrook Ridge and other places, it's not a 100% complete surprise. Anyway, why did hemlock disappear from these ridges? Um, I can't be sure. You can say, oh, Willie Adelgid. Nonsense. Willie Adelgid came in how many years ago? 10, 20, 30? Early, mid 90s. Mid 90s. What, 1990s? That, oh, OK. Well, so that's impossible. Uh, wait a minute. Be careful there. Wait, Brett, Carolyn's trying to come in. OK. Uh, anyway, uh, there is one idea. I, can't, I thought I'd find a reference on it, but I couldn't find it. So maybe it's only on, a, on, a, maybe it's only on, a, on, the, uh, on the computer rather than a paper reference, that there were some investigators working in bogs in Quebec and found old hemlock from thousands of years back where the needles had been chewed by some native defoliating insect and the hemlock decline came after that. So it might have been some sort of an epidemic that hit the hemlocks thousands of years ago. Uh, a native insect, perhaps, uh, could have been fungus disease, could be any combination of things. And this will lead me in my next topic, that hemlocks tend to come and go, to, even today, naturally, in other places. So why the hemlocks disappeared, not sure. How about a climate change? I kind of doubt it, but I cannot be sure. Hemlocks can grow over a wide range of climates and soil conditions. And that would seem a little less likely uh, why they died out. And there may be almost no reason at all except chance. That's a horrible thought, but it may be true. OK, next. Um, I have, this, this is OK. That's done. This I won't spend much time on. We'll go through this fast. Uh, this is just bogs with lost hemlocks. This is just a data table, which gives the, the bog and the sample number and the location, the elevation, when it was found and when it had, by the time it also had disappeared. I already mentioned that pretty much. This just duplicates uh, what that map did, supports the map. But I do want to show you this. Let's see how this works. I prepared this map. Some, oh, those of you in the 3500 Club and the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference will recognize an older version of the base map, which is New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, which makes some really fine maps. Uh, not only for hikers, I use them for history, for all kinds of things. This is a hemlock distribution map of sorts. And these 1600 numbers are groves of hemlock I think there are 1,500 numbers. There's one down there. I have to remember what I, what I classified uh, as 1,500 series and others as 1,600. Uh, by the way, I number things. Don will be amused with this, and maybe Pete. I number things the way railroads number their locomotives and cars. Uh, I can't help it. That's the way I do things. So you have a 1,600 series. You got a 1,500 series. It's just it's like running a railroad, the way I work all my classifications here. Anyway, these are high elevation isolated hemlock groves, which I want to talk about. Where's the one up on the saddle between Eagle and, and, and Big Indian? Here it is. Is that a 50? I can't see the whole thing shaking. That's a 1500 number? Yeah. OK, a 1500 number means that it's first growth forest. It's original forest. The tanners did not get to it. The loggers did not get to it. It's an original forest. That is, it's not been uh, utilized by people. 
if there's another 1500 number, I can give you another. Here's some more. Let's see, where are these? 1522. Oh, is that the Millbrook? It's out of focus. Yeah, that's the Millbrook Grove. Uh, I just had the Catskill Forest Association there for a field trip just this June. Where's 1500? Just curious. I'm, I'm leaning up to something. 1502. We're, oh, wait a minute. We're, between, we're in the saddle between Double Top and Big Indian. Oh, that's the Pigeon Notch, the headwaters of the Pigeon, uh, um, pigeon Brook. Uh, that's the Pigeon Notch. And there's a 1504. I don't know, I'm not sure where that is. I don't know if it's that important. Well, we got to figure out where 15. Oh, oh, I know what that is. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Is that Balsam? Yeah, the Balsam Lake Mountain. Okay, that's Blackbrook Ridge, which is south and east of Balsam Lake Mountain. That's a high elevation grove of eastern hemlock that the bark peelers never got to. It was too far from a tannery, too inaccessible. Anyway, these uh, and the 1600s are pretty much high elevation, isolated hemlock groves, uh, which had been barked by the bark peelers and the tanners. But I did want to mention about which was the one between Big Indian and Eagle. Which one is that? See, I'm slightly out of focus. That's why I'm having trouble reading it. This one here. It's in the saddle between Big Indian and Eagle Mountains. Um, that one is on its way out. And it's been going, it's been um, uh, on, on, what's it saying? It's dying out on its own. Uh, I remember being there when I was a grad student. And I haven't been up there in maybe 10 years or so to see how it's doing. But they're old trees, and they're just dying out, and there was no reproduction. That grove is on its way out. And you might say, huh, Willie Adelgid. No, 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 no. That was declining long before we had Willie Adelgid. So what's doing it? Is it a disease? I don't even think so. I think just the grove is getting old, and it's not reproducing or hasn't reproduced, and it just kind of goes. And you have other areas where the hemlock is coming in uh, on, its, on its own and reproducing, especially under northern hardwoods, under beech, birch, maple, ash, oak uh, forests. Uh, the, the hemlock is coming in as an understory tree under these larger, older hardwoods. So you have places where hemlock groves are expanding. And simultaneously, in other places, you have places where hemlock groves are shrinking. And there are other places where they're kind of holding their own and neither shrinking nor expanding. In other words, over hundreds of years, over thousands of years, hemlock grows in cycles. It comes and goes. It can be in one spot for hundreds of years, but in other places it doesn't. It, it disappears, it reappears, comes back. That's why I think um, may have affected these, these mountaintops, these ridges, that used to have hemlock that no longer, that it wasn't necessarily climate or soils or a disease or a defoliator, but rather just the natural cyclical nature of the hemlock where the groves come and go on their own, uh, some of it having to do with chance, how, much, how well it reproduces, and, and so forth. But before I get to the next topic, I didn't want to tell you about this map because there's, there's some good news about this, we hope, and that is, why did I make this map? I made it a number of years ago to help some of the people out, with the, especially with the DEC, uh, who were worried about the Willie Adelgid and other people with the, with the CRISP, which is Catskills Regional Invasive Species Partnership. Uh, people like that trying to help them out because these people are just in fear of this, this Adelgid and biting their nails and all nervous, and I'm trying to quiet them down a little bit by saying, you've got these high elevation hemlock groves. Some of them have been barked. Some of them are in first growth. And some of them are so isolated and so remote that maybe it's going to take a long time for the adelgia to get up there, if it gets up there at all. And that would give us more time to find a way to combat the problem. It gives us a little bit more room uh, and time to figure out how to combat and fight the the adelgid by knowing that these groves are up there and may not be affected, or if they are, it may take a long time. And one step farther, if I'm thinking ahead way in the future, if we lose all or most of our hemlocks in the major valleys, oh, this is the Big Indian Valley, this is the, no, this is the Big Indian Valley, here's the Dry Brook uh, Valley, never think would be down in here. If we lose most of our hemlocks in low elevations in the valleys, 
lower slopes, people might be able to go back up to these high elevation groves and collect seed from these high elevation hemlock groves and bring the seed down and start planting hemlocks to reforest after the threat of the adulgate has passed and most of their food supply is gone. Maybe. It's something to think about long time into the future uh, that maybe these high elevation groves will save, a, save the species in the Catskills. Whoops. That's what I think about. Next. What's next? Oh, now we want to get, oh, I see what's next. Oh, yeah, OK. Um, my t-shirt. Uh, this is not just to wear as a garment. It's, it's to um, use as an illustration about the relationship of the tanners and how they find the hemlocks 200 years ago, 175 years ago, and what the forest looks like today with the hemlocks. This is the mountaintop arboretum, which is north of Tannersville. Uh, about five years ago, we had a natural resources inventory done for the arboretum. There were about six or eight of us working on all different topics of, of natural history of the arboretum. And my assignment was to do a forest history. So that's what this map is a result of. And I submitted my map and my report. And the next thing I know that Mark Wolf, the director, uh, put my map on a t-shirt. So anyway, I can use the t-shirt as a map. Um, so the, 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 it's for sale at the Arboretum? Oh, OK. Well, when this one gets dirty with my lunch, maybe I'll need to replace it with a new one. Anyway, uh, the northern third of the Arboretum was a farm called the Parker Farm. That's where the education building is today. It's in the old Parker Farm. And the southern third of the Arboretum was in the Showers Farm. So you have places in the Arboretum that had been um, Old fields, old pastures, there are stone walls, there are pioneer tree species that have come in. But in the middle of the arboretum, that's just this green belt here, in the middle of the arboretum uh, is a portion of land that had never been farmed. It was always forested. And a lot of that is hemlock. They have a hemlock trail there in, in that portion of the arboretum. And Mark and I did a lot of work. We were coring trees, to turning Mark as a director. Uh, we, were, we were working together, coring trees, trying to determine the age of those hemlocks. Not a bog coring. This is what's known as an increment borer. You take a dowel of wood out, and you count the rings from the tree. And uh, we found that the oldest hemlocks, which were running well, about a yard in diameter, uh, were running about 250, 260 years old, some of the oldest ones. So they, they look like old trees, and people say, oh, this is original growth forest, this first growth. No, no, no. Uh, we, we hardly think so, because we're not that far from the tanneries. There were some small tanneries in the Elka Park, Tannersville area. The big tannery, of course, was um, Edwards over in Hunter. And it, it seems that an, an accessible, in an accessible, not inaccessible, accessible area like what is now the Arboretum, it seems almost impossible that the tanners could not have gotten in there. So how, why do you have trees that are 250 plus years old and, and, and a yard in diameter? Well, think about it. Go back 200 years. You know the growth rate of a hemlock. What did that stand of hemlock look like when the, when the uh, tanneries came in about 1820? They ran 1820s, 30s, 40s. By the Civil War, they were pretty much done. So what did it look like back then? Well, these hemlocks were probably about this big in diameter. They were young. If, they were, if they're 260, 250 years old now, they would have been 50 years old then, 40 years old, 60 years old. How big were they? About this big. Well, is there a minimum size limit in which a, a tanner would, would take a hemlock for its bark? Um, they wouldn't take all the hemlocks out of there, just the larger and the older ones. The reason is a young hemlock, which is a sapling or a young tree, that's only this big in diameter. How much bark does it have? Not enough to be commercially viable. Just, it's just too small to supply a good chunk of bark. So they'd leave it alone. They'd go buy it. 
So these 260-year-old immense hemlocks that we see today on the Arboretum were just youngsters, and the tanners would have gone by and just bypassed them. If the tanners uh, went to a, um, a stand where there were no hemlocks at all, well, they'd go right by. And suppose, suppose they went to a stand. I got to get this right. I have it here. Um, Wait a minute. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't need to. I got it right here. Is that upside down or right side up? And this is OK. A hemlock timeline. OK. If bark feel is found in the years 1800 to 1865, that was the height of the tanning industry. That's when Pratt was running here in Prattsville. Uh, if the bark feel is found, they would, and this is what they would do, and this is what it would look like today. Uh, so if they had a grove of young hemlocks less than 12, 10 to 12 inches in diameter, or none at all, they just leave it alone. Why? Well, there's not enough bark. If, there's not, if the trees are too small to supply bark, that's not use, useless for tanning. And um, a grove of middle-aged hemlocks mixed with hardwoods and with some hemlock sapling reproduction. Um, there's a picture of that in here. I think it was in the historical views. There was a, 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 a drawing, a lithograph of, I don't want to find, waste the time finding it, of a hemlock stand that's mixed with hardwoods. You've got young hemlocks, old hemlocks, hardwoods all mixed in. They would just take those hemlocks down that were over 10 or 12 inches in diameter, had enough bark. And in these two situations, old growth, mature hemlocks, this is what you'd see today, with some groves is disintegrating after 200 years. No hemlock reproduction. Uh, that's um, the topic I want to get to next is on hemlock reproduction. And the example is here in the mountaintop, Arboretum. Uh, this is a different situation. If the bark uh, peelers came into a grove of mature hemlocks uh, without any reproduction, just old trees, they would have harvested them. There would be no reproduction. And what you'd have today is an old hardwood stand. And you say, what can that happen? Yes. I know of one prime location where that happened. I think I have a few places in the Catskills where I know it was barked and there are no hemlocks today. Well, why not? Well, there was no reproduction back then. And there's one place. There's a friend of mine who is a Woodland Valley historian, Paul Misko. And Paul has done something that no one else has done in the Catskills. He has mapped the whole Bark Road network in Woodland Valley watershed. Uh, the Simpsons and the Snyders, the two tanneries. He's mapped all the roads. He's hiked them all and followed them. And he led me once to a, a upper Bark Road, which is on the north slope of Cornell Mountain. He led me to this Bark Road. Uh, at, uh, at the north base of Cornell Mountain. And the bark road ended in an old hardwood stand. No hemlocks there today. They've just died out. They must have been all harvested, all cut down. It must have been a mature stand. And I, there were other places like this. I'd have to go through thousands of pages of field notes to try to find other examples. But that's one prime example of it. So what the tanners found 200 years ago, 175 years ago, pretty much has an effect on what we see today and what's going on. See what's next. We're about 2 thirds of the way through, aren't you happy? Oh, Clark's Tannery. OK. I'm watching my clock. We started a few minutes late. I'm hoping to do this in an hour. So who cares? <laughs> I read maps up and down all the time, especially if you're going south. You push um, OK. <clears throat> Here's Clark's Tannery uh, map. I did this for one of the issues of Catskill Fire Association newsletter, where I write about all kinds of things. Uh, forest ecology, forest history, history of industrial forestry. This is one example of industrial forestry. And um, I know 
our town of Middletown, Delaware County historian. Well, wait a minute. Diane Galicia says she's not the town historian. She, she's president of the HSM, which is Historical Society of Middletown, as opposed to being the Middletown town historian. Delaware County, which is basically Arkville, Margaretville, Fleischman's area, eastern end of the Pepacton Reservoir. This is Middletown. It's where I live. And Diane told me that uh, in the annex to the Margaretville Public Library, the, the uh, Fairview Library, uh, there is a, uh, the archives of the Historical Society of Middletown in, in Margaretville. And she said she, she had received a donation from one of the members of the ledger from the Clark's Tannery. What's a ledger? It's a book that has all the financial transactions of the tannery, uh, from whom they bought the bark or got the bark, how much they paid for it, how much it cost, the date, the location. That was a gold mine of information. I went down in there one day in that little annex to the uh, library and spent a few hours going through the ledger. It's all handwritten script, and it's very hard to read uh, somebody's writing sometimes. You're trying to figure out what kind of a puzzle is this. Uh, it's like hieroglyphics. How do you know what they're writing? And I found out this information from what I could gather from there. I want to go back and look at it again. That the Clark's Tannery was in a location called Clark's Factory. We call it now Dunraven. Uh, I don't know if people even call it that anymore because the post office was long gone. It's really a suburb of Margaretville. And there were actually the Clarks, I think they had two tanneries in there. This would be running 1850s, 18, I think 1850s, maybe early 60s, when that ledger dates back to. And it had information on there that I couldn't never dream that I would be able to get. Because what was, not, and not only that, but how they were working in the Catskill High Peaks. Now, we have to learn about from, from this museum what Pratt did. I know a little bit, but not enough, that in the high peaks of the Catskills, like Phoenicia, Simpsons, and Snyders, they had their own land, they had their own bark, load, uh, bark roads, and they'd go bark their own lands, which they owned. And, and the, the same would have been for um, the big uh, empire, wait a minute, what the name, what was uh, Edwards Tannery, the New York Tannery in Hunter. Uh, was like that. The ones in the high peaks. When you get out into Delaware County, which is more an agricultural area, the tanners not only had their own land, but a, lot, one of the, a big source of their bark income was from farmers. They would buy it. They would go out on the farm and harvest the hemlock and then pay the farmer for the bark so that you, you, don't, you have fewer bark roads in Delaware County. That's what my article for CFA News was about. And the reason why you had fewer bark roads is because the tanners didn't need them. Why didn't they need them? Because they could use the existing farm roads to get to the hemlock groves in most cases. So they, that's why when you hike in the woods in Delaware County, you seldom come upon a bark road uh, because the farm roads were able to do the job and probably better. So they were up my valley, which is Dry Brook. The, the Clarks were all the way over here. They were buying from William Avery Farm. Um, they were buying from the Bakers, uh, the Stephen Baker Farm. Actually, uh, Betty Baker, who is a descendant of them, and she's a friend of mine. Uh, I'm not sure. I think this may be an error about the bark pile up at Seeger, or Seeger. I think I may have that wrong. I think the bark pile was downstream in a different place. But that, that's, that, that's why there's a question mark. Um, I did read from other sources, not necessarily from the ledger, that two of the farms in Kelly Hollow were barked by Clark, the Ward Farm and the Newton Farm. If you know Kelly Hollow, you know there were five farms in there. And we had that, well, John, you were with us. I think you had a private tour that time because you couldn't make the others. We had a big, uh, the, the historic side of Middletown, we had two tours of Kelly Hollow all the old farms, all the old plantations, 
um, the, the, the sawmill, the railroad that served the sawmill. Uh, we had so many people the first time that we had a, an overflow crowd, we had to have a second uh, hike. So the Clarks were buying bark from two of the five farms in Cali Hollow. Um, I did find a bark road going up in Huckleberry Brook. The, the existing Huckleberry Brook Loop Trail that comes out of Cold Spring Hollow and goes south follows a bark road for a distance. And that bark road seems to end where the hemlock is, ends today. That might be by chance, I'm not sure. So there are a few bark roads in, in Delaware County. And then I'm still trying to figure out where Sebastian Roundman Farm was up on Dingle Hill near Andes. So this is telling me that the, the tanners did more than just own their own land, build their bark roads, and bark their own lands. And very often they were buying bark from farmers and other people. And I know that this is Sullivan County. I did a project a few years ago to help out the um, Time in the Valleys Museum down in Gramsville. And uh, the tanners down there, in, there, were th there, was, there, were, there was one in Claryville, there was one in Ladleton, and one in Denning. And they would buy bark from the farmers on Red Hill if you know that area in the town of Neversink and the Catskills, Southern Catskills. And one thing I've always wondered, and Carolyn might be able to help us with the people here, this is, I think I did read once, that I've learned how to pronounce it, Zadok, not Zadok. You can dock a boat, but you can't dock Zadok. Uh, Zadok Pratt did some bark work over in the Roxbury so he must have been buying from farmers over there if he didn't own the land. So this gave me a whole new insight into the, the tanning industry of where the bark was coming from, that it was not only coming from lands owned by the tanneries directly. It came from farms and farmers. That might be the last of the illus of, the, of them. OK, next two topics, and then we're, we're, we'll be through on time. Next topic has to do with, I call hemlock, we can probably shut that down unless someone wants to see some, one of these transparencies again. But if we shut it off, I have that fear, it'll never come on again. So anybody have a request to see another map for something? Well, you can, I have paper, uh, paper editions of these anyway that you can look at later if you wanted to. So shall I shut it off? I know that's going to work. It loves to shut off. May I shut it off? Oh, I don't. Good. The hum is annoying me. OK, two more topics. One has to do with what I call hemlock is weird. And that the reason it's weird is that it, it has trouble reproducing in its own shade. Um, and it's odd because the other shade tolerant what we call climax dominance of the Catskills, have no trouble reproducing in their own shade. That would be sugar maple, beech, red spruce, and balsam fir. A sugar maple, American beech, balsam fir, and red spruce. Those trees are shade tolerant. They can not only, uh, they can dominate a site. Dominate means that they, it's more than being abundant. Dominate means they actually control it. They can pretty much determine what other organisms are living under them, in them, in the soil, beneath them, and on top of them, and so forth. They control the site. Those four other species reproduce in their own shade very well. And hemlock is a very shade tolerant species. And you think, well, it can reproduce in its own shade very well. It can't. For some reason, it can't. And we think we know the reason. And you find hemlock most often reproducing under a mixture of northern hardwoods, beech, birch, maple forests, maybe coming in under oak and, and cherry, uh, rather than coming in under more hemlock. And I thought, well, may, maybe it's shade. Well, no, hemlock can tolerate that shade. That's not the problem. Uh, there's another reason, and it's called allelopathy, but I'll get to that in a minute. I did want to mention one thing. Pete, Pete Sentiment made a discovery and he showed it to me, and he, by gosh, he's right, that red spruce will reproduce well under hemlock shade, but hemlock won't. Red spruce will reproduce under hemlock. That's what you found, and you're right, it works. 
But uh, hemlock has problems under hemlock shade, uh, not because of the, the low, low intensity of light. In fact, a lot of plants have trouble under hemlock. I remember bushwhacking down a slope of Big Indian Mountain years ago with some friends. And we were really annoyed with, with blackberry thickets. We were getting all scratched up and raspberries. And I said, look, there's a hemlock grove down there. Head for that. Why? Because there's not going to be anything underneath it. I mean, if it's dark enough and shady enough, and uh, there's nothing at all. So we head for the hemlock grove, and then it's easy sailing down through the hemlock grove. You can get out of the blackberry thickets. Um, so there are other plants that are affected by if the hemlock is too much, too dense, too shady. Uh, it will shade out other plants. Um, and you have a lot of bare ground and bare soil underneath hemlock. A few plants might grow under there, a few mosses and a few herbs, but not much. I've got a, a, a colleague at Paul Smith, so I used to have a colleague at Paul Smith's College where he used to teach, who used to come in and lecture to my courses on uh, allelopathy. Um, basically what that is, plants poisoning other plants. There are plants that produce chemicals in the soil by the decomposition of leaf and branch litter that these chemicals can um, slow down or prohibit the growth of other plants. And this is pretty well documented in, in individual cases. And I remember uh, Tim would tell me, I once asked him, can hemlock be allelopathic to its own young to provide to prevent them from growing under its own shade? And I think he said, he said yes. There is some evidence for that. That is, that plants can poison other plants. And it, it, what it does, it pretty much eliminates the competition. But why hemlock would want to stop its own reproduction, maybe because you want to use the term nose, use the term in quotes, nose, that mature hemlocks know that their young uh, saplings and seedlings won't do too well uh, under their own shade, and therefore try to keep them out and not even start up to begin with. Go reproduce under hardwoods. It's better under there. I think they're really taking care of their kids is what it amounts to. Don't start growing under me. This is not the best place. That's what, what they're saying. And I do have a few other examples of such things. Then I want to get to the wood wide web. And then I'll just make my comments and introduce Erwin, and then we'll be through. Um, I have some examples. Well, I have wrote them down here. Where am I going to find them? Oh, here we go. Uh, I think the most classic example of plants poisoning other plants is black walnut. It's hard to grow a lawn or anything else under a black walnut tree because it produces a substance upon decomposition of the leaves and twigs and bark called juglone. comes from the scientific name for the walnut juglans, which inhibits the growth of other plants. That's been well documented. People knew about that when I was in grad school. And that was back when, in, in the uh, Mississippian? <laughs> yes. OK. No geologists here? You know when the Mississippian was? It followed the Devonian. Um, OK. Uh, that, so that's, Also, I've noticed things in my own backyard. And I haven't been able to prove it, because I need to set up a laboratory experiment, test it, see it, but I haven't had the time or the ability, that I used to have a lot of red pines in my backyard. And those red pines that were growing surrounded by goldenrods died. And the ones that didn't die have no or very little goldenrod around it. So I'm saying the red pines died from goldenrod poisoning. No, I'm not sure. I haven't been able to prove it. But I'm suspicious uh, that certain species, not all species of goldenrod, how many species of goldenrod do I have in my backyard? I got four. But up and down Dry Brook, you might find eight or 10. Um, but a few of them are acting so that they seem to be, seem to be creating the, the, pine, the red pines to die. Because I brought some red pine samples in to show the guys at the CFA, the Catskill Forest Association, what's the matter with my red pines? Fungal disease? No, no, no. Defoliated? No, no, no. Can't be soils. I wonder if it's allelopathy, uh, goldenrod poisoning. No, we're not sure, but it, it's possible. And the last thing is something I've discovered only in the last few years. You think of trees uh, and, and, and herbs. That is allelopathy, plants poisoning plants at the tree level, the shrub level, the herb level, 
what's going on at the ground cover level, what's going on with mosses and liverworts. Well, this may not be allelopathy, it may be something else. But I like to study mosses and their cousins, the liverworts. They're little tiny plants. How many species of moss do we have in New York State? About 400. How many do we have commonly in the Catskills? Maybe about 100. How many liverworts? A few dozen species. And I've got a bunch in my backyard, and I've been watching them as uh, logs decompose slowly. I'll get a liverwort, don't worry about the name of it, Noelia curvifolia comes in all over a log, with a fresh log, where the bark is off, and this liverwort comes in and takes over. You get a whole uh, covering of this liverwort called Noelia. And then if you watch it over a period of several years, the mosses begin to encroach upon it. And the mosses are bigger and higher. And I have one called Hypnum imponens, which is all over the place. And Hypnum imponens and a bunch of other mosses come in and replace this liverwort. They actually smother it. They grow over it, shut out the light, compete for the water and the log and the nutrients. And there are, other, and there are places where there are mosses out competing other mosses. And this I don't necessarily mean as allelopathy. It might be uh, in other words, there may not be no poison involved, and maybe just one plant crowding out another, shading it out, competing with it for mineral nutrients and water and sunlight. And that leads me into the last topic, which is my commentary on Wood Wide Web, and then I'll introduce Erwin and turn it over to him because he knows a lot more about it than I do, especially from the fungal aspects of it. Uh, and now, I had a, when Carolyn asked me last spring, m make some comments on the Wood Wide Web, I said, World Wide Web? She said, no, no, Wood Wide Web. So I look, what is it? It was something new. So I did, I do have a small library of articles on it. Uh, on, this was what, New York Times Magazine. I think you gave me this, and I made a copy of it. Here's New York Times. It's, it's also, uh, it's been on, um, I have a, some notes from a, a National Public Radio program on it at one time. So it's getting to be quite well known. And what it says is that just the reverse of allelopathy and competition is that plants and trees may be helping each other out. And there is evidence from this study in, I believe it's British Columbia, the Pacific Northwest, of certain trees. Actually, if, if, if a tree is in trouble, even another species, help will come through the mycorrhizal roots, the mycorrhiza in the roots, and one tree will help feed or nourish another that's having a problem. And I can understand within a species, but to me it was harder to grasp why among different species, but apparently that happens too. One example was birches help Douglas firs, or was it the other way around? Yeah, so, it went both ways. So I, I try to add some Douglas firs up behind my house that were dying, and I try to put some paper birch litter around it, and it didn't help, but maybe it was too late. But anyway, um, so there is evidence that trees can help each other and plants can help each other by feeding. Uh, I do know that if you look at beech, when uh, beech, beech produces all these sprouts that you're trying to push through all the time, they're a pain in the neck when you're bushwhacking. And usually what happens is that those beech sprouts are being helped along by the parent beech until the parent beech gets a disease. So my comments would be about the wood wide web is that when you see all these things going on like allelopathy, plants poisoning these plants, and even if they don't poison, if it is just physical competition for light and nutrients and water, my idea is that wood wide web occurs in some places for some species some of the time, but not in all places for all species of plants all the time. It happens here and there and here and there, whereas over here it's allelopathy and over there it's competition, and who knows what combinations. So I'm not a 100% convert to this wood wide web uh, because I see too much competition and allelopathy going on under my nose in my yard. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that it happens sometimes in some places, uh, and among some species, but I don't think it's everywhere. So let me introduce Erwin, and I'll, Erwin, I'll shut up. Erwin wants to make some comments on the Wood Wide Web. Erwin 
is the president of our board for the Keiko Mutish Natural History Preserve. Did I pronounce that correctly? Close. Close. Keiko Mutish Natural History Preserve, which is in Stanford. Uh, you may know him from the Farm Hour on WIOX Radio. He's with uh, Open Eye Theater. You can list a whole dozen other things that he's involved with. And he's also a very fine mycologist running all kinds of mushroom walks and lectures and so forth. So what else can you want me to say about you? Uh, no, thank you. But, but except that you have the, the mycorrhizal expertise, the fungal expertise, to talk about the wood wide web, but I can't. Whoops. Is that train on time? I'm sorry, that's me. Oh. Well, as long as it's on time, it's OK. It shouldn't be like Amtrak. <laughs> no, I, I think the main thing, um, you know, we talk about these experiments um, with uh, fur sharing nutrients with uh, uh, birch and then um, transferring them back. Um, it was an experiment done in a lab in England, and then Susan Samar did it in the field in British Columbia. But the reason she was interested in that was she, when she was a grad student, she was hired by the forestry division of the Canadian government. Um, and they were basically looking at um, how do you get um, clear cut um, entire mountainsides to uh, get um, either lumber or paper. And um, the paper companies, it's more efficient to just clear cut. They put seedlings in. When she was a grad student, she was supposed to document how all the seedlings were doing they were always dying. So, you know, fast forwarding several decades, she went through this whole journey where she did the experiment, <coughs> shaded a birch, and um, radioisotope tagged sugars came from the fur to the birch, and then she shaded one, exposed the other to the sun, and the nutrients went back. And in three or four decades since then, most of her grad students have kind of followed up on that, and. Um, at least in terms of what happens after clear cutting, she's proven that if you leave as little as 10 to 10, uh, 20 percent of the trees intact, that's going to preserve your soil biology. So there's going to be uh, fungi, they might be mycorrhizal, um, they might be endophytes, there's probably bacteria involved, but if you don't totally disrupt that ecology under the soil, new trees can come in. Um, if you totally clear cut it, um, you're kind of destroying that ecology and um, whatever type of sapling you put in, um, mainly the paper company just wants one species of bare root tree that they know they can sell. Um, so if you want trees to come back, you really have to keep in mind what's going on under the soil, which microbes and fungi, um, they're not always well documented. I mean, if you're doing ornamental trees, like New York Botanical Garden, they routinely, they just, you can order certain inoculums, which are fungus specific to certain trees. But um, if you do a major interruption, like when they clear cut for the wood acid or the tanning industries, um, that may have created um, niches where the hemlocks didn't come back. And then there was other places where there might have been some mixture of other trees that were preserving fungi and microbes in the soil. And then the hemlocks kind of radiated out uh, from there. So that's kind of in a simple way. And then, you know, in a more sophisticated way, if you're doing like K and F uh, permaculture stuff, um, we're doing different things where we're trying to grow out different um, microbes and fungi and then, you know, kind of expand it out in fluids or in compost piles and then put it, um, and again, um, on the farm where we're working, it was a dairy farm, the soil's compact, how do we get this to be more productive? And it's uh, looking at those uh, microscopic, so single cell organisms, single cell and multiple cell fungi, um, they are cooperating and then they're also cooperating um, with herbaceous plants, woody plants. Um, 95 to 100 percent of uh, plants do have some kind of organism that either wrapped around the roots or actually entering at the cellular level. Um, all trees do, um, most of the herbaceous plants do. So that's, um, you know, we're starting to document it. It was virtually, you know, unknown a few decades ago, but um, I think if we look at which species come back and how vigorously they come back, particularly the hemlock, whether the disturbance is from the insects or from the wood acid industry, um, there's going to be these unseen organisms that are becoming appreciated that are also playing a role.
I've got a You've got to repeat that more slowly for me on, on the effect of, of the wood wide web on what you think. Oh, so yeah, they can. So um, I can take exchange notes on nutrients, it. and they may exchange information. There are some experiments. Who is they? Hemlocks. Um, yeah, different trees. Um, if there's, uh, say, a pest um, entering the area, they will. Um, other trees will put up chemical defenses against those pests in some cases. So the information they believe. Uh, it's not pheromones through the air that it is going through mm -hmm. the mycelial mat under the soil. Um, microbes might be involved, electrochemical impulses. Well, we have to apply all that to what might have happened 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. That would take a bit of time and thought. What happens now? Does Carolyn throw us out? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, at 2.05, well, we're just, we're just sure people right now. If you want to answer your questions or make it informal, there's uh, cupcakes. Mike, what is the connection between hemlocks and bogs? Is that just hemlocks, in, and, hemlocks and bogs? I mean, is it just incidental that the bogs... Oh, oh the bogs. And especially high up on the mountains. Um, well, hemlocks can grow over a very wide uh, uh, diversity of, of soils from the very driest to the very wettest. So they, they dominate a lot of these bogs. Actually, technically, they're more like fens, which are bog-like, yeah. but there are some subtle differences. So they can grow. The hemlocks have no trouble growing in these wetlands. It may grow more slowly, but they'll grow. But then what was the rest of your? Well, just the, I was just thinking in my head, a connection between bogs yeah. and hemlocks, and why, why you were able to find all the hemlock stuff when you do your coring. And, and it's just because they, they're nearby and the, the seeds and the... And the well, well, you mean why there's so much hemlock in, in yeah, the fossil in record? Right. Because hemlock is and was a very abundant tree throughout the Catskills. And this has been this way on a variety of sites for 13,700 plus years. So hemlock is everywhere. That and yellow birch are the most common trees I find fossilized. By fossilized, I mean pieces of bark, wood, needles, sometimes cones. Cones, are immature hemlock cones can be this tiny, and you find a whole cone. Uh, it's just that they're, they are ever-present and were ever-present. So they show up in the bogs as well as in places uh, that are not bogs, which would not be preserved. The fact is that what happens when you have this wet acid environment, like a bog or a fen, it just slows down the whole rotting process. So it preserves plant parts. Whereas in an upland soil situation, within a few years or decades, the, all of the, the parts would be rotted. So would, so would you say that the, the tanning that happened like a couple hundred few years ago has dramatically reduced the abundance of hemlocks, or have they kind of bounced back to? Well, I, th I think they've bounced back in a number of places, not all places. In some places, they've disappeared. In many places, they're coming back. There are a lot of hardwood stands that have hemlock reproduction under them. It's a hemlock understory, and a hardwood's always story. I've got some right up on the hill behind my house in Dry Brook. I have hemlocks coming in under hardwoods. Sometimes they come in together. And how old are the, the oldest hemlocks that you found in the Catskills, would you estimate based on? Oh, I don't think we need an estimate. I think we have ring counts. Okay. Um, the Arboretum, at 200, what, 260 years in this belt right in here, yep. um, they're, they're up there. Uh, the Mill Brook Grove, where I have brought all kinds of groups of people in to see it, are also running about 260. It's rare to find a tree in the Catskills that's 300 or more. You'd have to really be hard pressed to try to find it. I think do, they I, not, do they not live much longer than that? Or like, like? I think what happens is if they're around for 250 years or more, they just they get old and they kind of get weathered and they don't do too well. They have a lot of damage up in the crown from ice storms and heavy and winds and heavy wet snow. They get heart rot, that is, the, the interior wood begins to rot out so that they become more wind prone, they, they, they can easily get blown over. They just, they just get weaker 
and they lose their, their strength and ability to grow. They still grow when they're 250 years old, but they grow more slowly. They're just, they're just not as strong as they had been, and that's pretty much their limit. I remember, I think I found a 300-year-old red spruce on top of Indian Head when I was a grad student. That was about as old as I could get. And it wasn't a hemlock, it was a spruce. Yeah. I'm thinking about uh, glaciers. And the, the, I think I remember oh. there was um, like... Your lunch. I'm, that there was a, a mini ice age glacial period before the 13th and 14th. Oh, yeah. So, so what are the antecedents? What are the oh, pre-glacial, glacial, is it marine, uh, limestone-y? What, what was oh the gosh. cauldron or, I, I don't know, the incubator you know, what of was of What Hemlock. was it like before the Wisconsin and Ice Sheet, which is the last one? Yeah, maybe the, if that's the right timing, yeah. What, well, we had four, four ice, advances, ice advances in the eastern U.S. and Canada. I, I think I, I know the last two. I mean, I wasn't there. I wish I were, but I know what they are. <laughs> but the first two, I think it's the sequence is, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's Nebraskan, Kansan, Illinoisan, Wisconsinan. Wisconsinan being the most recent, and I think the first one was Nebraskan. And then the second was Kansan, or is it the other way around? I may have switched those two, but I think Nebraskan was first. Kansan, and then Illinoisan, Wisconsin. It's, it, the, I'm almost, I can't believe the question you asked. The reason is that yesterday, just yesterday, a friend of mine called me up and said, can I stop by at your house? And he did. And he brought, he had just come out of a cave near Albany with clay and charcoal in the clay. And he said that he had had some of that charcoal radiocarbon dated, and it was over 45,000 years old. And he wondered what the, what the charcoal is. So he brought the specimen to me yesterday, I haven't had a chance to look at it, to, to determine, see if I could identify under the microscope what the wood was that was burned into charcoal. And if I can figure out what the tree or plant was, then we know what was growing before the last ice age. And that would be, to my knowledge, I'd have to work it out with some of the glacial geologists. I don't know if anybody knows what was here before the last ice age, and this would be a first. Um, I think my question is kind of like, where do babies come from? Where do hemlocks come from if there are glaciers right before them? Well, there were refugia, glacial refugia, places where vegetation and animals and fungi would all, so to speak, hide or live during the ice ages, and they were all pushed south. So there's evidence of having boreal forests, spruce and fir forests in the southern United States, and even, don't, don't quote me on this, the Gulf Coastal Plain, southern Appalachians, areas that were non-glaciated, they were all hiding down there. And when, they, when the Wisconsin and ice sheet retreated to the north, these plants migrated north. And I've been studying the migration routes of a number of these species, but all after the most recent ice age, which is the Wisconsin. And uh, I asked some geologist friends of mine, what was happening 45,000, 55,000 years ago? And I said, were we, was the, were we already under the Wisconsin? And I said, oh, no, no, it hadn't come yet. We're in the, what we call the interglacial, the Sangamon interglacial, between the Illinoisan and the Wisconsin. And, and I forgot when the, when the Illinoisan retreat, and I have to look that up. I don't have it in my head. I used to teach it. I do know that the Pleistocene is about 1,600,000, but that's all four ice ages. So I'm not sure. So uh, as far as I know, no one really knows what was growing in New York State during the last interglacial period. And if I can get this wood identified, and uh, Paul can get the radiocarbon data, then we'll have some idea what's going on. So it's, kind of, it's, it's, it's really quite a coincidence that you asked that question. Because just yesterday, I got the charcoal, I haven't had a chance to look at it. He gave me some pieces a few weeks ago, but they were so tiny and fragmented that I just couldn't handle them, because I have to make cross sections to see the cell structure and put them under the microscope. And if, if, the, if the charcoal just falls apart when you touch it, 
you can't see the anatomy and you can't identify whether it's a hardwood or a conifer or what. So just stay tuned. Maybe we'll learn something. Oh, uh, I did have a professor at Syracuse University who was a geologist, a fellow named Ernie Muller, he's long gone now, who used to tell us that he had found Sangamon Age glacial till in rock crevices and a ledge somewhere in central New York. But that was just glacial material, nothing that could be radiocarbon dated or identified. And if you go, there's a place in north central Pennsylvania that has Illinois and till. Where the Wisconsin didn't go quite as far south as the Illinois and moraines. So you have Illinois and till exposed. Is it Hickory Run State Park? This goes back 20, 30 years, I have to remember. And, but that's just glacial deposits. I don't know if anyone's actually found any organic matter in those Illinois deposits where they could radiocarbon date it and identify it. So we're opening up whole new worlds where no one's been before. So are you with your mycorrhiza. You're opening up new worlds. Yeah. <laughs> We're discovering old worlds. They've been there. We just haven't paid much attention to them yet. <laughs> what happens now? It's snack time? Yeah, well, that's it for the four